Well, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Ross Virginia. I think I know everyone in the room, and welcome. Nice to see you here. Um, today, um, we're making a series of presentations from the students in Biology 138, Earth Sciences 128, which is Introduction to Polar Systems. Um, this is a graduate course open to all students, but it's required of the Polar Environmental Change IGERT Fellows at Dartmouth College. And the, 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 the task for the students, this is sort of a culminating activity for, the, for this term, was to identify a scientific topic of interest to them or one that was important in the course. And they were to develop a, a short, succinct presentation to communicate the science, but to communicate the science to a, a broad, informed audience. Uh, many of the students in this course will be uh, talking about science uh, in a workshop in Alaska in the spring term. And that will represent a range of people from the sciences and social sciences, uh, earth scientists, ecologists, engineers. And so the thought was to, to gain some understanding and, and practice in, in presenting their discipline um, in a way that many others could understand it. So the talks, um, uh, the topics were selected by the students. Um, they have approximately 10 to 12 minutes to make this presentation. It will be time for a few questions. Um, uh, we're running this as a scientific meeting, so if you, you can come and go as you wish, um, and others may be joining us as we move along. Um, the sessions are being taped, so the students have an opportunity to um, observe uh, their presentations at a later date, and I, I urge them to actually do that. It's a very helpful part of the process. Okay. Um, I must say that a lot of different faculty participated in the course, and if you look at the, the the program we have here, you can see a list of faculty that, that made presentations. Um, my job in the course was mainly to coordinate and kind of cheerlead and, and hold this together. And I really want to thank all the faculty that participated um, in, in the Polar Change course this fall term. So um, with that introduction, why don't we get going? Um, uh, the, the order of the presentation sort of represents a shift through several different themes. One of the major themes in the course is to connect Western science with traditional knowledge. That's a theme for the whole year um, in the IGERT program. And so we decided to start with a presentation that, that, that began to show you how we might bring some of these topics together. So our first presenter is Thomas Overly. Um, he's a PhD student in the Earth Sciences Department. And the title of his project is Bridge to Somewhere, Crossing the Scientific and Traditional Knowledge Divide. Thanks, Thomas. Hello, my name is Thomas Overly, and the title of my talk is Bridge to Somewhere, Crossing the Scientific and Traditional Ecological Knowledge Divide. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it simple. I'm going to talk about science and traditional knowledge and where exactly they overlap and how they can combine to create a richer understanding of climate change. And uh, there appears to be a big overlap, but in actuality, there's, it's actually fairly narrow, and there's some challenges and uh, different ways that science treats traditional ecological knowledge that I'm going to try to touch on. Uh, first of all, just looking at the Arctic uh, and the stakeholders in the Arctic, the nine different countries uh, spanning the various ways of defining the Arctic. And then you also have uh, many different uh, native First Nation groups. Uh, these are just happen to be the ones that are uh, politically organized, but there's a wide range. And so I'm specifically going to focus on Greenland because that's where my background and experience is. And so I, uh, most of these groups I will not discuss. But I'm not native, I'm not First Nation, and in fact, how can I you know, give a talk on traditional ecological knowledge? Um, fortunately, I have been able to travel in Greenland. Uh, I've been to Greenland four times and traveled extensively for a three-month period looking at knowledge production on climate change both from a scientific and traditional ecological perspective. Uh, it was three months traveling around Greenland, um, participant observation with hunters and fishermen and local residents, and also on the ice with uh, scientists. Uh, so just touching on science very briefly, um, usually it involves uh, some sort of logical framework. Um, so it needs to be repeatable testable, and uh, hopefully has some sort of predictive power. So we all know the, the basis of science, and this. Um, but today I'm going to speak about traditional ecological knowledge and what that might entail. 
So uh, oftentimes it's described as lived experience. So just the knowledge that somebody gains by uh, working and living uh, in harsh conditions uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And a lot of times it combines uh, both a phys the physical aspect and a social aspect. So this could mean um, looking at the landscape and having a creation story that describes parts of the landscape or a, a cumulative social knowledge uh, passed down over time. And so there's uh, aspects of both physical and social. A, a lot of times it isn't written and, or recorded, but uh, oral, or uh, get, gets its strength from the terminology in the language. So having a very complex way of describing snow particles or uh, cold conditions. And it's also evolving over time. So it's, it's not some uh, permanent thing that's just revered and looked back upon, but it, it's constantly changing and evolving and building upon uh, either the community or the individual group of uh, bands of hunters that are going out and accruing this knowledge. And it also usually tends to focus on extreme events. So if it's an everyday occurrence, maybe that won't be, it's just, it's almost common knowledge to the point where it's not considered anything unique, but uh, instead uh, looking at extreme events. So mass migrations or giant fluctuations in population or uh, rapidly changing ice conditions. <coughs> uh, a lot of times, uh, in the literature, you, you'll see science and traditional knowledge compared side by side, but uh, this is actually uh, not doing justice to, tr to traditional ecological knowledge. There's a lot of power and balance here, and I'm not going to discuss this. This is beyond the scope of this talk, but if you want to learn more, you can read uh, this Nadasdi paper from 1999. Uh, so instead, uh, we have to focus on areas where there is some overlap, if we're not going to compare them side, side by side. And uh, the, the key component is uh, both science and traditional ecological knowledge are rely on observations, uh, looking at the environment around you or looking at the world around you and trying to describe it and figure out what, what's happening. And a lot of times, or these days at least, science isn't conducted uh, by the lonely scientists sitting under a tree. It's in collaboration with peers. And uh, that's also the case with uh, when building uh, traditional or local knowledge about a certain topic. And also, science isn't placeless, and neither is this traditional knowledge. So it's very uh, site-specific. And again, the general idea being that you're, you're observing nature and uh, getting information directly from that observation of nature. And so to begin, uh, science a lot of times uh, starts out with this very novel view of what traditional ecological knowledge is, or, or uh, romantic. And uh, we have to move beyond those ideas of Nanuka the North or the Noble Savage and realize that, in, in the, the case of Greenland at least, um, there's a fairly modern infrastructure there. So uh, here's just an example. And most, when I say hunters and fishermen, I'm very rarely referring to a Greenlander that goes out in a kayak, but instead is uh, in a motorboat, and usually a, a fairly large motorboat with a complex engine that they're going to know how to take apart. Uh, the motorboat is their, or the motor of the engine is their life. If they're going out onto the water, they have to be able to solve any problem that can come up. And so uh, there's, a, there's just a little bit different perspective as a scientist when you're trying to think about, okay, how can the work I'm doing uh, overlap with what the hunters or the people in, in the Arctic might be observing? Well, let's uh, try to be realistic about what conditions they're living in in the first place. So then these are just also pictures from nu Nuke and some high-rise apartments and a traffic jam. And again, uh, just traveling around uh, in the hunters and going in their homes, you see they have appliances. They have refrigerators and electric tea kettles and even a chandelier with uh, energy-efficient light bulbs. And so there's, uh, again, we just have to be aware of this and, and not uh, just think of or create this other that is an, an igloo or some other thing. And uh, d so, but despite all these modern advances, uh, the key thing is they're still in an extreme environment. Weather is dictating almost every aspect of life. And uh, they're out in, it, in amongst it every day and are occurring and developing this very specialized knowledge. And uh, there's uh, uh, many different uh, topics I could focus on, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to look at seal. So there's a, a one potential for traditional ecological knowledge is uh, looking at uh, different conditions of the seal. So in this particular case, is this a skin condition? Is this an attack from a polar bear? 
would a wildlife bio biologist be able to tell the difference? Uh, in this case, the hunter I was out with seemed to think that this was a, 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 what he's pointing at is some sort of skin condition that they've noticed in the seal. And so this, this is, illuminates an area, possibly an area for further study. Uh, the next slide has a seal being butchered, so if you're queasy, uh, look away. But um, the, other, the other case is looking at seal and the, their blubber on seal as a proxy for climate data. So a cold winter, the seal's most likely to have less uh, blubber. It's exhausted a lot of calories throughout the winter. And uh, so every season, the, the hunters kind of get a feel for where that seal has been previously, up and down the coast, if he, he came from the north or from the south. And there's just a, a wealth of data that, that could potentially be uh, integrated with current uh, biological studies. So again, there's uh, changes all occurring all throughout Greenland and throughout the Arctic. Um, many different possibilities for overlap or for um, uh, extended study. Uh, I'll, these are just a few of them in addition to the seal. And so, uh, let's see, there's a lot of uh, challenges though. So of all those areas, it looks like, oh, this should be simple. Um, but there's quite a few challenges. I'm only going to discuss a, a few of them. Uh, first of all is just, do we have data that overlaps? So are the, are the field surveys that biologists might be doing uh, near settlements that there's uh, traditional ecological knowledge or hunters? Um, a lot of times there might be the observation of similar events, but their explanations are quite different. So if we're, we're seeing uh, increased plant growth and the scientists are going to attribute this to warming, whereas the locals think it's because there's extra water in the streams along uh, tributaries. So there, there could be uh, different, different explanations for uh, similar observed phenomena. And the other important thing is uh, not to just treat uh, traditional ecological knowledge as this token thing that we have to include in our research proposals. So we're going to do outreach. We're going to do education. Oh, and we should, we should get some local knowledge in there, too. Uh, that, that's not that kind of uh, defeats the purpose. And uh, there needs to, there's going to be areas where traditional ecological knowledge really can fit in and be beneficial. And there's other areas where um, there, there perhaps isn't going to be an overlap. An example being a lot of the radar data I looked at was trying to connect uh, extreme accumulation events uh, to coastal observations of major accumulation events. And uh, in short, it just it couldn't work out. We, we tried and tried, but there was just not enough um, solid or solid grounds for an overlap. And the other thing is also to not overstate the importance of TEK. So I'm, I'm talking about how important it is, but at the same time, it, it, it's not going to be a fix-all, and it's, um, we have to be cautious how it's used, uh, especially the, from the locals' perspective. They're giving up this information, this valued information, and they don't want it used in any way that might uh, be in disagreement with their beliefs. So, but despite all these uh, challenges, there's several others I, I don't have time to discuss, but uh, the, bi the big factor, the big potential for overlap is in ecology and wildlife biology. Uh, the best wildlife biologists usually have the most hours in the field observing the animals and observing uh, what, what's happening. And uh, these fishers and huntermen are out there every day doing that. And uh, the home rule or the self-rule government in Greenland is already using uh, hunter surveys and uh, population reports from hunters up and down the coast to determine hunting quotas. And so of all the, all the various areas, uh, wildlife biology and ecology have the most uh, opportunity for uh, integrating and producing a richer understanding of climate change. Uh, so overall, melting ice in Greenland is changing age-old ways of moving about and living in the landscape. And the question becomes, uh, how best can scientists, policymakers, uh, locals, fishermen uh, integrate and combine in new and creative ways to better to produce a, a richer and more robust understanding of climate change. And so as you uh, hear the, the following talks, uh, try to think about uh, how a local that might be observing these uh, phenomena, how what their perspective might be and where they might be able to contribute. And so part of this work was uh, supported by Fulbright, so I have to acknowledge them. And then I also would like to thank you for your attention. Questions? Sam? That, was, that was a great talk. Uh, I wonder if you could just elaborate on, uh, as your 
very first slide that you had a great diagram up that um, mm -hmm. had DEK uh, science, but it also had reality as the, the third sphere. Right. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and uh, maybe point out some examples of science that don't fit into that realm. Of uh, science? Yeah, or, or like things that things that would be not in reality that would be in those other spheres. Well, there's a a lot of problems with uh, is this observation or these are these new phenomena are new phenomena occurring or is it just an increase of an in observation so we're we, now we have sensors that can scan all the glaciers up and down the coast so have these glaciers always been moving or is it just the fact that we are we're able to monitor it better um, perhaps uh, a lot of times science tries to co-opt traditional knowledge and say okay traditional knowledge has to fit into this scientific realm. And that's, that's going to be a, a major challenge, is getting scientists to uh, look beyond the fact that, OK, traditional ecological knowledge is not peer reviewed. It's not um, going to meet the rigors of science, but yet it still is able to contribute in some way. And so uh, there's, just, there's a lot of uh, difficulty in getting a room full of scientists to say, oh, well, that's going to be valuable to me. Any other questions? Um, do you have an example, uh, just another example of where uh, TDK can be overused, like sort of your cautions about how to use that knowledge? So you, you said it's, there's a concern that it would be used in the wrong way. Well, a lot of, uh, at least in Greenland, the idea is the, let's say, the more or the, the fewer animals they report seeing, um, the that's going to determine what they can hunt the next year. And so it's in their best interest to possibly underreport if they if um, if within this system that the self rule government has set up. I mean, there, there's there's that's one potential exploitation. I know in Alaska and Canada, there's just there's a lot of concern about do we get the rights to these animals? I mean, if, are they do we are we allowed under current whaling conventions to take a certain number and then uh, do with what we please? So, for example, in Greenland, I think right now they just uh, almost two days ago agreed or signed up with the, the EPA of the EU, the European Union's equivalent to the EPA. And uh, they are now, the first two whales that are taken belong to the home rule government, or the self-rule government. And so that's just one example of these structures that are, gonna, are controlling animal populations that locals might be concerned about. And so anytime you have an outsider, a scientist coming in and saying, hey, tell me all about everything you know, um, it's, it's kind of like asking a fisherman, hey, what's your best fishing hole? So I can go there and, and because they, just as scientists might have difficulty understanding traditional ecological knowledge, a local person is wondering, why are you looking at this moving ice? I mean, what does it matter? And so there's, there's potential, if, if we don't educate ourselves about the realities on the ground, there's potential for uh, mistrust, miscommunication, or no progress. Well, let's thank Thomas for the really excellent introduction. How do I close that? Um, our next presentation is going to shift to thinking about what do we know about the history of change in the Arctic. We know it's rapidly changing now, but how does that relate to past change and past environment? And, and how can that information about the past inform the future? And uh, Alex Lauder from the Earth Sciences Department is going to talk to us about ice core and Earth's planet history. <coughs> So cancel. Yeah. She's the second oh. Okay. Thanks. Okay. My name is Alex Lauder, and I'll be talking about ice cores and uh, Earth's changing climate. Um, just to start off with the images here, just show a couple of drilling sites at Vostok in Antarctica, and um, Neem in Greenland. 
choose me. So uh, first I want to talk about evidence of Earth's changing climate from a lot of different sources. Then we'll get into talking about the ice and structure and what we can learn from it. And uh, then uh, we'll go through Earth's uh, past climate, events that have happened in the past, and future implications of this. Um, of course, one, uh, one piece of evidence that tells us that Earth's climate is in fact changing is just uh, differences in, uh, in glaciers, in precipitation, in uh, temperature, all of which uh, could be factors in changes at Mount Kilimanjaro that probably a lot of people have uh, seen images of. So uh, first, our evidence comes from a lot of sources, like I said. So um, first, we have historical records. The Little Ice Age just uh, ended. It was actually a course of different cooling events. And the last one was in the mid-19th century. So we have historical records. We have archaeological records of settlements that were supported by means that aren't possible today. We uh, also have biological evidence, past extent of ve vegetation and insect species. And of course, uh, dendrochronology. If you study tree rings, actually a very important source of information about past climates. In some ways, the rings of a tree are very similar to ice cores that we're going to go into more detail about. Of course, uh, sediment is actually has a lot of biological components which you also use and take core samples of. And you can also work out temperatures and climate changes. Of course, um, also there is sea level change. Glacier extensive change is uh, with evidence from moraines and historical evidence. And uh, of course, we get a lot of information from ice cores. So uh, information of ice, so most of our sites, uh, most uh, sites for drilling come from Antarctica or Greenland. Um, starts off, uh, all, all of it does start off as just snow. And as this is compressed, it becomes fern, and eventually, it will be compressed into ice when you have pore close off, which is probably around 70 to 100 meters down, where, the, where air that is trapped in the snow gets compressed further so that just bubbles of the current atmosphere are trapped inside. Uh, something important to note about that is the air that is trapped within the bubbles within the ice is a different age from the snow around it since pore close off happens much after the snow was first deposited. You can see layers in this image here from uh, ice in Greenland. The National Ice Core Laboratories draws a lot of ice cores for the United States. These are maps of different sites. Of course, there are more. There are sites, of course, that aren't in Greenland and are, are in Antarctica in alpine locations. Vostok that I mentioned can be seen in Antarctica. And uh, one here that we'll talk about more is uh, GISP-2 in the center of Greenland. This is, uh, this is a backlit ice core sample that you can see here. The banding corresponds to uh, layers made annually. Uh, also from ice, besides just the visible layers that you see, dust can be deposited. In fact, dust from volcanic events is uh, very important when it comes to matching up separate cores, uh, since that dust can be deposited worldwide. Also, uh, conductivity is a good measurement that can uh, tell you the acidity in the ice, which also can tell you when these volcanic events occurred. And of course, the air bubbles I mentioned earlier uh, also give us a record of what the atmosphere was like in the past. We can learn about carbon dioxide. We can learn about the uh, of course, the temperature from that by studying isotopes that are in these air bubbles and the ice. Now, the, we're going to learn, in later presentations will go more in detail about isotopes. Uh, for working out temperature, uh, isotopes within water have been used in the past. This, uh, but also to work out temperature, a technique called borehole thermometry is also used. This graph here at the top shows temperature that has been determined from ice cores. Below that is a graph that shows carbon dioxide that has been measured. You can probably tell that they match up pretty closely. So it does help to show the link between carbon dioxide and temperature. The bottom image shows dust. 
and uh, that is also captured within the ice. You can also see that there is some pattern here with lower temperatures, we'll see more dust. Also, there is uh, there are similarities between the certain between different cores. In fact, the ice cores can match up with your core uh, temperatures, and events can match up with uh, cores also from dense thick sediments at the bottom of the ocean and other sites. Uh, this appears from that Vostok core down here, which uh, goes back 400,000 years. This core goes back twice as far. And you can see in this case that deuterium is a hydrogen isotope that is used as a proxy for temperature in some cases. In fact, uh, matches up with uh, the separate core up above in the first part. You also might notice that there is a pattern going back. About every 100,000 years, you can see that there's a pattern that uh, is uh, attributed to Milankovitch cycles. Because of the Earth's, Earth's rotation and the orbit does change some over time, then uh, that is a major factor in these cycles that the Earth is going through. So uh, since the last ice age, the climate has also been t changing. It's been relatively stable, but it isn't quite constant. So I thought it'd be good to go over recent events. Some of these are shown in ice cores. Of course, there are a lot of other, uh, other sources, and a lot of these are fairly recent. So after the ice age, something that's noted in ice cores and other sources is that when the Earth started to warm, it cooled again fairly quickly. Uh, then uh, after that, the Earth continued to warm. So about 5,000 years ago, there was another cooler period in neoglaciation. And then we had the middle, medieval warming period from the 10th century to the 13th century about. And the Little Ice Age, that is, uh, that is comprised of three uh, separate events, or three, uh, it's three separate maxima for cooling. The latest one was in the 19th century. And of course, since then, we've had reasonably steady current warming. So it can be attributed to uh, coming out of the Little Ice Age, but also we have unusual circumstances at the time. Since uh, carbon dioxide levels are uh, completely different than anything that we've seen in the past 800,000 years from our ice cores. So future implications. Uh, things are good to take into note when you're thinking about the future is that Earth's climate will continue to change. It has always been changing, and uh, also that this change can happen relatively rapidly. In some cases, ways, uh, in, ways that can't, in plenty of cases, ways that can't be described by uh, current models for climate. And uh, also we are in uncharted territory when it comes to uh, our levels of carbon dioxide. People are uncertain uh, what will happen in the future. And uh, it's good to continue to research and to, uh, so we can make better plans, preparations for mitigation, and uh, hopefully preventing further warming if it's possible. So uh, thank you for your time. and. Uh, if you have any questions, it comes now. I was wondering if, if anyone knew what the link between temperature and, and dust accumulation was. Why the things were together? Um, I guess it's, uh, I know some, in some cases, it's uh, you, you have more rainfall on deserts and then uh, so then you'll have less dust in the atmosphere. But I think there are other reasons as well. Isn't there something to do with glaciers too? Mm -hmm. More glacier, it's colder, and there's more outwash plains or something like that? Yeah. When it's colder, it's windier, yeah. and the dust yeah. travels farther. Yeah. Also, when it's colder, where's the water? Yeah, we have ice. In the ice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, use more land. There's more land. It's
Well, thanks. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you. Well, one of the things that was mentioned in uh, Alex's talk is the use of isotopes um, to generate information about the past and past climate. And um, so we're going to hear a number of talks that, that sort of focus on that. And the next talk is the first of those. Uh, ben Kopek from Earth Sciences is going to talk about the link between sea ice and precipitation in a changing Arctic. Although we said I was going to talk about isotopes, I actually will not be. But um, <laughs> so I am Ben Kopek from the Earth Sciences Department, and I will be talking about the link between sea ice and precipitation in a changing Arctic. Um, <clears throat> this process is very important in looking at climate dynamics, especially in the Arctic. It is very important and has been seen in numerous global warming events in the past and other past abrupt climate changes. Um, this race relationship also has numerous economic and ecological impacts for the Arctic region. So in the past, uh, many most storm systems for the Arctic, the air masses have to travel from a uh, water-rich source, such as something from la lower latitudes, such as the Pacific Ocean or Atlantic, where evaporation of water can actually occur. So generally, at higher air temperatures, um, evaporation rates are much higher. So in a climate change scenario with warmer air temperatures, you would think that um, greater evaporation rates over the Arctic area could occur, which would allow for more moisture in the air. But, so in, but we need an actual local source of water, of water to be able to have this process occur. So this is where the melting of sea ice becomes a major player, which allows evaporation to come from a local source. Um, when we look at the general trend of from uh, the relationship between sea ice and precipitation, we can see that a general temperature increase allows for the melting of sea ice, which exposes more of the ocean. This uh, exposed ocean allows greater evaporation, thus more water vapor in the atmosphere, and this allows for enhanced precipitation within the region. So in order to be able to see what this future of the changes are, we have to look at the past. Um, by observing uh, from satellite imagery to see how sea ice extent is changing within the recent years, we can see that in the past few decades there has been a general decline in sea ice extent, and this loss of sea ice is actually increasing within the more recent years. If we observe the satellite of the changes between the past and present, the red area here shows the sea ice extent in the September of 1980. And the white area shows the extent of sea ice within in uh, September of 2007. And you can see that there's a much greater loss of sea ice within this uh, summer minimum time. It's, almost, uh, it's just over four, uh, 4 million square kilometers in size. So when we put these past uh, trends together, we can produce some projections on how sea ice will change throughout the future. Uh, this, um, this uh, figure here shows that there are a, a series of computer models projecting sea ice change, and the, the thick black line in the middle shows the project uh, the mean projection of these climate models, and the red line actually shows <coughs> the observations with that we have currently, and you can see from here that the sea ice loss is actually much greater than any of the projections, which is very interesting, and. Uh, go, there's, that also shows that there's a lot of complex events that are occurring within this feedback cycle. So now going back to the, the feedback connection between sea ice and precipitation, we know that there are numerous other processes going on that are furthering enhancing the precipitation. One being the ice albedo feedback, which I won't touch on much because latches are will be going next with that. But it's just the basic idea is that as sea ice melts, the dark ocean waters are exposed, absorbing more of the, absorbing more of the um, sun incoming, incoming solar radiation, thus warming the earth, enhancing the cycle. Another part is the increased water vapor within the atmosphere. So as water vapor 
is increasing, that, which is a greenhouse gas. The greenhouse effect thus is increased, warming the earth even more. Also, precipitation and other water vapor things, such as fog in the atmosphere, are another cause of sea ice melting, thus further enhancing this process even more. So when we look at uh, back in 2007 with the IPCC fourth assessment, they were able to develop a relationship between temperature and precipitation. So they were able to determine using the A1B scenarios for the Arctic that by the end of next century, temperature uh, response or the precipitation response to the temperature changes will be uh, pretty sizable with range uh, determined, determined, depending on the temperature change can be anywhere from 20 to 30 percent. So if we break this down into the annual cycles, if you look at the figure on the right, this shows the uh, projected temperature change by the end of the, of the century using under these scenarios. And you can see that the greatest temperature change will be during the winter seasons, but there will be an overall pretty sizable uh, change in temperature over this region. The, the middle thick black line is the mean of the various models that were in this, and the darker gray area was in the interquartile range, the 25 to 75%. So you can see that there's a temperature range anywhere from three to seven degrees Celsius within the change within the seasons. And going along with this, there's a, you can see that precipitation follows pretty directly with the temperature correlations. Thus, the most precipitation change will be seen in the winter, but there will also be sizable changes throughout the entire year. Anywhere from uh, 15 to 30 percent on average, and some models are showing much greater, of anywhere up to 40 percent or more. So in conclusion, we can see that there is going to be a significant melting of sea ice to occur, which will thus increase the uh, precipitation within the Arctic region. So what does this mean for the Arctic? You can see that there's going to be numeral, e numerous ecological and human impacts because of this because of the system. One of the main one of the main things will be an uh, increase in river discharge because of precipitation. If we look at the graph on the right produced by Peterson, he has shown that in the past uh, 60 years or so, there has been a general trend upwards of river discharge. And now if we continue to add on top of this the process of increased precipitation, this can be seen to be further increased. Um, changes in lake volume will also be occurring with increased inputs going into the lake. There will also be likely increased evaporation, so this process can be of interest. And also just the general loss of sea ice will have a major impact within the region. So for the ecology, we can see that there's going to be major changes in habitat area for various species. There's also going to be changes in the migration routes. So for humans, this can be a major player in, their, in some of the traditional hunting and fishing practices that occur. And so this is going to be this uh, relationship between sea ice and precipitation will be of utmost importance to some of these communities in the near future. Questions? Um, how does increased precipitation lead to sea ice melting? Um, it's a lot of it has to do with. Uh, well, water, just the water, actual water, warm water that's falling as precipitation will cause some melting, and then general water vapor in the air will, and clouds will have an impact on, <coughs> on the melting of ice. I don't know what Lachazar has in his presentation, but I have to assume that some of the solar radiation part will be. Sorry, I don't want to steal your thunder. Yeah, no, if you want. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> so, and you mentioned fog too, so fog could fall to accelerate the accelerate the melting process. Process, yeah. So, constant contact with water. Don? Yeah, uh, you said, okay, right now we have a current amount of precip in the Arctic that's mainly a consequence of things that affected from lower latitudes. Mm -hmm. And that uh, in the future, there'll be 20 to 30 percent more. Of that additional precip, is there a breakdown of how much of it is just increases from lower latitudes versus how much of it is local precip? Mm -hmm. I've always wondered about that. That's a very interesting <laughs> question. That's my master's thesis. Yes. Oh, okay. oh. So yeah, so looking at various isotopic compositions using uh, deuterium or oxygen-18, you can be able to determine the source of the water. 
Okay, yeah. so it will be in the rain drop thing. Yes. We'll, we'll start there, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if you want to talk more about it, actually. Right. 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 So the increased will happen also during the winter, right? So what does that imply for permafrost? There will be more snow on the permafrost in the winter. Does that have an implication for permafrost melting faster or slower? Is that be a... So is, well, it would probably insulate the ground more, which actually may reduce permafrost melting if going along with that. I thought about that, though. That's an interesting idea. Although the, the winter is when, the, when it freezes back down, because it's with thin snow cover now, it allow, or in the past, it allows freezing back to, to down to the previous levels. So if we get more snow, it, it may insulate better, so it won't freeze down as far. So it may actually okay. contribute to melting. melting. Yeah. Maybe. Then it gets into the timing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it, is it, when does the snow fall? And then when does the summer rain would accelerate and melt it? That's well, a lot of it. And they're expecting more of that, you know, precipitation in the Arctic in the winter to come as rain. Is it oh, they are. Mm -hmm. So there's like these ice events that are affecting caribou. Um, but it'll still be primarily snow in the winter, right? They're not mm -hmm. expecting, yeah. Well, thanks very much. <laughs>
and finally f sub c is the conduction heat flux uh, which is basically the heat flow between the surface of the ice and the bottom layers which may be at a different temperature. Um, so as I said uh, we add up all these terms which may be positive or negative and we get the net energy balance. If that's positive then the ice is going to melt on the surface and if that is negative it's going to freeze or, or just not melt. Um, so here's an example of how these fluxes work out um, from the Taylor Gl Glacier in the McMurdo Dry Valleys in Antarctica. That's from a paper by Hoffman et al. Um, and so these data are actually from a model, but it's been fit to 11 years of uh, meteorolo daily meteorological observations. Um, and the notation is a little bit different. The Qs are basically the same as the Fs on the previous slide. And QSI is the incoming shortwave radiation. QL is the net longwave radiation. Uh, QH is actually the sensible heat. QE is the um, Latin heat. And QC is the conduction heat. So, um, and this is over the course of one year. So what we have on the bottom is just the months of the year. From, Ju from July until June. Um, so one thing we notice is that the radiative fluxes dominate here. Uh, so in the summer there's a large shortwave radiation flux and there's a pretty constant net negative longwave radiation flux as well. Um, however, the non-radiative fluxes are also important. In particular, uh, it's kind of hard to see, the sensible heat in the winter and also the Latin heat in the summer. Um, and also we have the net energy balance, that's the Q sub M. As we can see, that's very close to zero. There's very little melting occurring. Um, and the glacial ablation is mostly by sublimation. Um, moving on to sea ice now, what are the differences? So let's first focus on the plot on the left hand side. So here we have the exact same fluxes, and as you can see, the radiative fluxes are quite similar to what we see in the ice sheets. Um, again, the short wave and the long wave, same pattern and same mag similar magnitude. However, one striking difference is that the non-radiative fluxes are very small. Uh, the radiative fluxes completely dominate over the, the non-radiative ones. And that is generally the case for sea ice. The only exception is young ice that has just been formed. And that's this figure on, on the right. And here you can see that even over the course of just a few days, there are wild fluctuations in all the fluxes. And, in, and also you can see that the non-radiative fluxes are uh, quite important. That's the only exception. Um, so just to make things a little bit more quantitative, that's actually a homework problem that we all did in the Iger course. Um, but basically what we did was we looked at um, the energy balance for sea ice on sunny summer days versus cloudy summer days. Um, and we simplified things by looking only at the radiative fluxes, so we simplified the equations and dropped the non-radiative flux terms, which we saw were not as important. And we also put in different values for the albedo for the different types of surfaces, snow, bare ice, ponds, and leads. Um, and as you can see, in the summer, obviously, there's a large shortwave radiation flux. Um, and when it's sunny and when it's cloudy, there's a large long wave radiation flux and the outgoing long wave is always the same. Uh, so here are the results in this diagram. As you can see, uh, the energy balance is positive for snow when it's cloudy and negative when it's sunny. So snow is more likely to melt on a cloudy day. That's because it has a very high albedo, which makes the short wave radiation term very small and the long wave rate, incoming long wave radiation term much more important and that's larger on a cloudy day. 
For ice, as you can see, things sort of even out. Uh, it's just as likely to melt on a sunny as on a cloudy day. And also you can see that as ice melts into ponds and leads, uh, the energy balance for those becomes much more positive. So there's this positive feedback loop, which is basically due to the albedo. As ice melts, its albedo goes down very significantly, as you can see. Um, and so it absorbs much more radiation, and it's much more likely to keep melting even further. So this basically explains the rapid melting of sea ice in the summer, and also its rapid loss due to global warming. And I'm going to repeat what Ben already showed. Uh, this is the, um, a picture that shows you how, how much sea ice has decreased in the past three decades or so. Uh, and that's just the extent in the late summer. And the red area, which shows the reduction in extent, is basically about the same area as half of the United States. So the average rate of decrease has been about 9% per decade, but it seems to be accelerating in, in recent years. Um, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, assessment, which was uh, published a few years ago, that's the IPCC4 report, uh, Arctic temperatures have been increasing uh, at about twice the global rate in the past 100 years. And we think that albedo feedback mechanisms play a central role in, in this amplification of global warming in the northern high latitudes. Um, also, and that's due both to sea ice melting and also uh, due to albedo effects in land snow cover, and we also think that um, anthropogenic soot is responsible uh, for lowering the albedo of snow. Um, the picture on the left shows the projected temperature changes. Oops. Sorry, it died. <laughs> I'm sorry. The computer died, but anyway. Um, it, it shows the projected surface temperature changes relative to the period 1980 to 1999, and the first column is the third decade of the century. The last column is the last decade of the century, and the different rows are just different climate change scenarios, some of which are more optimistic and some of which are more pessimistic. But in all of these, you can see that if you look at the northern high latitudes, the predicted temperature changes about two or three times the global average. Um, and that's, again, due largely to albedo effects. So just to summarize, the polar ice sheets, especially in Antarctica and perhaps to a lesser extent in Greenland, have a relatively stable energy balance with relatively little melting occurring at this point. They're not likely to just melt completely anytime soon. But in contrast, sea ice has a very unstable energy balance and can and can and does melt rapidly uh, in response to both seasonal and also longer term climatic changes. And that's largely due to positive albedo feedback mechanisms. Um, and also albedo effects associated with sea ice and snow cover play an important role in the overall amplification of global warming in the high northern latitudes. And so it is very important to understand all these mechanisms and to properly account for them in any future climate change models that we may want to construct. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions, please? Questions? Sorry. Seems like there's just a ton of positive feedback scenarios. Are there, is there any negative feedback that takes place in the system? Well, there are negative feedbacks, but basically uh, the albedo is definitely a positive feedback. Um, also, one thing we, we just talked about was perhaps the, the permafrost might be a negative feedback. But obviously there, there, there are lots of um, uh, things going on, and that's just only one, one little thing. Um, so that's that's a good question, yeah. 
So is the sea ice doomed according to this analysis? Um, well, Perhaps not quite. I mean, Don Farovich was saying that uh, it's unlikely to actually disappear completely, right? But it is, I mean, and, and I was talking about the Arctic. Obviously, the situation in the Antarctic is it's not as bad. It doesn't seem to be uh, disappearing there nearly as rapidly. Um, but it's certainly an endangered species in the Arctic, at least. Yeah, it's certainly at the current rates of, of decrease. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely uh, quite quite endangered. <laughs> yeah, just to toss out for sea ice, one negative feedback is it it really grows fast when it's young, uh, and, and so what that means is if you do away with all the ice and you have open water, there is a road to recovery if you cool off the climate. Because uh, the initial growth of sea ice, it's, it grows really fast at first and that hides a lot of sins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you have to touch the screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're just ahead. Yeah. It will go to sleep. Don't worry. It hasn't crashed. It's a bit disconcerting. I think it's come back to life. These are all the things we planned to do to help you simulate a professionally less friendly audience. So, um, well, our next presentation is by Blaine Morris from your Sciences Department. Um, the title of this presentation is On the Edge, Icy Margin Stability in a Changing Climate. There's a lot of random notes up here. I guess I could just grab some. Uh, yeah, thank you. Pick a talk. Great. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm Blaine Morris, uh, and I'm here to talk about uh, ice sheet margin stability. Um, and so I guess in the beginning, why, why do you want to talk about ice sheets? Um, well, it's, it's where most of the ice is, um, and it's where 90% of the fresh water on the planet is, uh, and it's likely going to be the source for most of the, the sea level rise that, that we, we might see uh, in the future. Um, and why talk about the margin? Well, the edges is are where uh, a lot of the stuff is happening. It's where uh, the ice meets the ocean, um, where the ice is the thinnest, and where... Uh, pretty much the most is happening. Um, so basically this is a mass balance problem. Uh, where's the ice? Where will it end up? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about ice flow uh, and then a couple of the more dramatic examples of uh, some processes that, in, that involve uh, really mass loss um, in, in, near the ice margin. Uh, a, a couple of more positive feedbacks to, to really brighten your day. Um, and then what, it, what does it mean for us? So ice sheets, uh, we'll, we'll take the edge of the ice sheet to, to be sort of a stereotypical, much simplified glacier. Um, so we have a, an accumulation area where uh, we're getting net mass gain uh, and an ablation area where we're getting net mass loss. Um, in between them is the equilibrium line, which is where there's no, no gain or loss. Uh, and on the ice sheets, um, so there, there's three ice sheets, Greenland, East and West Antarctic. Uh, and most of the mass loss or ablation uh, in these uh, areas is from calving. So ice being put directly into the ocean and, and floating off to, to sink ships. Um, on the left here uh, is a diagram of, of Greenland basically showing uh, elevation change uh, as a function of time. The, the red and orange um, is elevation gain, uh, green is, is no change, uh, and the colder colors are thinning uh, or, or elevation loss. Um, and you see up here in the top right from, from the, the fourth IP, IPCC report that a couple of other people are referenced at this point. Uh, some some numbers on what's going on in Greenland. Uh, so 
early in the century, about 25 gigatons per year loss. Um, and this varies a lot. There were actually some, some mass gain areas, as you can see uh, on the map. But uh, net loss of about 25 gigatons, which is um, water equivalent about a, a cubic kilometer. Um, and then accelerating uh, to, to the 2003 to 2005 estimate of, of 50 to 100 gigatons per year um, with estimations of, of more mass loss in the future. And, and you know, so what? Well, the sends up in the ocean, we only get maybe, you know, 0.17 millimeters per year. Uh, and, you know, what does that mean? Um, and it doesn't seem like a lot, but over, over time uh, and, and the, the climatologic effects of raising sea level that much uh, or, or can be pretty drastic. All right. And then there that I'm going to end up talking about. Uh, this is on near this J here uh, for Jakob Schaben. This is the uh, Jakob Schaben Isbre. Uh, it's one of the fastest flowing uh, glaciers in the world. And this is uh, some sites for some proposed research that Bob's going to be working on this coming spring. So, Yakushav and Isra. Uh, it's an outlet glacier, um, which basically just means that it drains an ice sheet. Uh, and it drains about 7% of the Greenland ice sheet, um, or about 50 cubic kilometers a year, about 0 0.06 millimeters per year of sea level rise, which actually ends up being about 4% of the total sea level rise uh, in the past century. Um, and you can see. Here are some contours for the glacial front uh, in 1851, all the way back up to, to nearly the present. Uh, and here's your scale. So it's really retreated quite a long way. Uh, and this retreat has been accompanied by some pretty drastic increases in the velocity of the ice at the calving phase. Um, and, and, there, and there's two reasons that this acceleration could occur, basically. Um, basically, ice flows from sort of a, at its simplest two, two basic uh, ph phenomena. One, from internal deformation, which is sort of limited by how much ice you have uh, and what slope you put it on. Um, the other is what the slope is made of, uh, how slick it is if there's water at the base. Um, what kind of sediment is at the base? In, the, in this case, water uh, is, is probably the big determining factor. Um, and the way that water gets to the base of the glacier, so water on top of the glacier to water at the bottom of the glacier, uh, is moulins. And how this happens, basically, is water collects on the top of the glacier in lakes, uh, and cracks form in the ice. Um, <coughs> because the density of, of water is greater than that of ice, uh, as long as a crack in the ice is continuously filled with water. Uh, and, and there's an estimate up here for, for West Greenland um, that, that the lake needs to be about one, one kilometer square. Uh, these lakes sort of share a, a loose correlation that they're about eight times uh, as big in surface area as they are deep. Um, so this is sort of the, the basic amount of water that you need to fill a crack to the bed, which at Swiss camp, sort of at the edge of the ablation zone, is about a kilometer. Um, so, so as long as these cracks are filled with water, uh, they will continue to propagate to the bed. When they get to the bed, um, moulins uh, can form in, in sort of catastrophic processes. It might, it might take days to weeks for these cracks to propagate to the bed course of hours to a day for actual moulin to open up and a lake to drain all the way to the bed. And if there's not sufficient water supply, the cracks just freeze up. Uh, and that's what this picture is. So, so that's sort of one way that we can speed up, uh, speed up a glacier and speed up this mass loss scenario. Um, the other way, which is, which is also uh, recently been somewhat contributed to in uh, Jakob Schaben's mass loss scenario is the influence of warmer ocean waters actually coming up under the ice. Um, and the most dramatic of the example of this uh, is in Antarctica. Um, here's some more numbers from IP IPCC. 
uh, just so you can get an idea of what we're working with here. Um, there's a lot more ice in Antarctica. If you melted all of Antarctica, it would be equivalent to about 61 meters of, of sea level rise. Greenland's only seven, but seven meters of sea level rise, we're still not in a pretty situation. Um, but so the idea here then is that these big ice shelves uh, are basically not grounded. Um, the ocean can come up onto them. Uh, and as we've seen earlier in this presentation and in and, and some of the ones preceding me, when liquid water meets ice, bad things happen for the ice. Um, and this destabilization can end up in, in things like what happened to Larsen B. So the Larsen ice shelf is a series of three ice shelves out on uh, the Antarctic Peninsula out here. Um, in 2002, Larsen A, which is, was up here, uh, and Larsen B, which is sort of going away in this photo, um, both disintegrated. They were about 220 meters thick, um, surface area of over 3,000 square kilometers. Uh, and that's a massive amount of water uh, ultimately melting and, and, and going to the ocean, affecting currents, all this. And the, the estimate released in the, in the fourth IPCC report was that, was that uh, one degree Celsius increase in water temperature would result in a 10 meter uh, increased melt rate um, for, for these shelves. So the implications of these sort of mass loss processes, um, as Lachesar talked about, uh, albedo is, is really of concern here because any time we get uh, more water, um, lowers the albedo, we end up with more heating. Um, the same thing can happen uh, near the ice margin whether it's because of calving and, and new ocean water or just extension of the ablation area. Um, the albedo of sort of bare ice and dirty ice is, is much lower than that of snow. Um, and also flow effects. Uh, if we get water incident uh, on the glacier bed, um, flow rates are, are much increased and, and mass losses is, is enhanced. Um, the other big issue, uh, especially uh, in Antarctica is if we lose those big ice shelves, um, what happens to the flow rates of the ice streams that were previously buttressed by them? And, and they can really uh, drastically increase. Um, and I'm sorry Tom isn't here to talk about thermohaline circulation, but uh, the possible effects of, of big freshwater outflows um, either into, into Labrador, into the uh, Greenland Sea or, or uh, off of Antarctica would have pretty pronounced effects. Um, and just to wrap it up, uh, Greenland and West Antarctica both seem to be uh, experiencing uh, pretty prolonged and accelerating uh, mass loss, loss effects, all of which at this point seem to be pretty strong positive feedbacks. Um, uh, a, a take home message for all of these things is that really small perturbations to these systems or really small changes can have really ranging effects. Um, and we, we don't have a good past analog for, for what's happening right now. So take that for what it's worth. Thank you. Any questions? Is it expected that Mulan formation will increase? Um, well, yeah, it's a possibility. Um, if, if we continue heating, uh, it, it's easily expected that you'll, you'll get more melting on the surface. Um, more water will end up in these cavities, and you will potentially have more lakes that are large enough uh, to have cracks that go all the way to the bed and end up forming Mulans which then, you know, more water to the, bread, to the bed exacerbates the process. There's actually f feedback between those moulins forming and more moulins forming? In, in some regard, yes. 
uh, because increasing, if you increase the ice flow, um, the, the tensional forces caused by speeding up the ice at the very edge of the glacier versus, um, say, ice farther up that's just coming off, uh, off you know, the ice sheet, um, you'll form more cracks and more crevices. Uh, and and the, avail the availability of areas that water can get into will be increased. Um, it's been implicated in, in stuff like the, the breakup of Larson B, uh, but it's a little, a little more of a stretch on a, on a wide scale. Uh, yeah. Is there a pattern to the meltwater pond drainage? So as the season progresses, you see ponds draining progressively further north, or is there I wish I could find one. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Stretch a little bit. Well, I'm going to hazard a guess that maybe there's isotopes in the next presentation based on the title. Or, am I okay with that? Let me find your. Our next presentation is by Kelly Everhart from the Earth Sciences Department. Um, Kelly's going to talk about raindrop fingerprints, deuterium excess, and the Arctic water cycle. Hmm. All the way on the left. Way down. Sure. This one. Ah, score. All right. Then, Great. Wonderful, thanks. Great, well my name is Kelly Everhart. I'm a master's student in the Earth Sciences Department and I'd like to chat about deuterium excess today. Um, now I like to think of myself as the Sherlock Holmes of, of raindrops and snowflakes. Um, now fortunately what I do is I retrospectively uh, reconstruct the history of a state of being. Fortunately more often uh, uh, rainstorms and snowstorms rather than uh, mysterious homicides. But at the end of the day, what I'd like to do is uh, communicate the importance of a couple of qualitative relationships that are useful to understand if you're not a stable isotope meteorologist, but you're still interested in using isotopes to inquire into the state of the Arctic hydrological cycle. So today I'm going to talk about the motivation and why it is I'm even standing up here. Um, I'll talk about uh, the idea of precipitation. It's actually a fairly robust, uh, multifaceted phenomenon that is useful uh, for many more reasons than uh, the conditions that characterize its deposition. So it's not just uh, something that helps personal ads. Um, I will talk briefly about the actual discipline of stable isotope meteorology. I'm going to ignore some of the more complicated um, physics and thermodynamics today in favor of a qualitative understanding of some relationships, like I said. Um, and finally, the significance of uh, what I, it's, what's called a secondary variable of deuterium excess. So this is one of my favorite photos. Uh, it's the inspiration of my research. This is my, uh, one of my two sites of precipitation collection in uh, Atkasuk, Alaska. Um, this was actually taken by one of my samplers, Doug. Um, that's caribou there. Um, great. So no one in this room is going to argue with me if I tell people that the global climate is changing, um, generally uh, warming in some cases. Now the Arctic is super useful, right, because it is both an indicator of and a contributor <coughs> contributor to global climate change. Um, it is an integrated anomaly or an integrated entity um, for many of the reasons that have already been discussed in the room today, sea ice, uh, precipitation, glaciers, all kinds of stuff. So if you think about water and the hydrological um, cycle, at the end of the day, global warming um, can be thought of as changes in the uh, global hydrological cycle because the water transports energy as latent heat. Um, so in the idea of a, a global water cycle, uh, water from the tropics transports heat from the tropics to, to the Arctic. Now unfortunately, um, it's difficult to study the Arctic hydrological cycle for a variety of uh, logistical reasons, generally polar conditions. Um, Windblown snow makes it really difficult to constrain uh, falling precip, um, inquire into falling precip. So if we're thinking about the hydrological cycle, particularly precipitation, there are three important stages uh, in the evolution of an air mass, of a moisture-rich air mass. Um, there's the moisture source, which is generally the subtropical high. Um, 
These, uh, this is the place where water is evaporated out of uh, the ocean. Um, the water, the amount of water, and the isotopic um, composition of the water, initial composition of the water, is determined by sea surface temperature, relative humidity, and the wind regime at the source. Um, water is then transported to its site of deposition. Now, the transport of water is uh, not a conservative phenomenon, meaning it is path dependent. And it depends upon, or the state of the water along the transport path depends upon both conditions aloft, um, temperature and relative humidity aloft, where the initial water has been advected, um, and conditions underlying the transport path, sea surface temperature, relative humidity, and wind, because that determines what water is actually added to that air parcel before its site of deposition. And finally, the site of deposition itself, this is actually the uh, collecting station in Atkasook, Alaska. Um, this is through the ARM research facility, so I'm using my master's research a little bit here. Um, now, at the site of deposition, we have determined that the most important meteorological variables are actually at the, um, at the altitude of condensation of precipitation. Oh, PowerPoint conversion problems. Great, so the water cycle. Um, water is composed of, uh, or the isotopic species of water are composed of um, both uh, hydrogen and deuterium and oxygen 16 and 18 in a variety of different combinations. We've already discussed those with Shahong in this class. Um, now, I'm super happy and my job exists because the isotopic species of water sensitively respond to phase change. So phase change occurs along, a precipitation's, uh, along precipitation's evolution at the site of, uh, site of moisture when it evaporates out of the ocean, along the transport path if moisture is actually added to that air parcel or if any moisture is uh, condensed out of that air parcel, and at the site of deposition where, theoretically speaking, all of the water is condensed out of the, out of the air parcel. So uh, the isotopic composition of water at its site of deposition reflects the entire evaporation and pre precipitation history of that air parcel, if you know how to look at it. So if I'm going to talk about st st stable isotope meteorology, I'm a stable isotope meteorologist, um, we measure three important variables out of a sample of precipitation that I get from uh, Atkosuk, Alaska. The oxygen-18, um, deuterium, and deuterium excess. Now deuterium excess is a secondary variable, meaning it's calculated from two primary variables, in this case deuterium and oxygen-18. Now these three variables are uh, sensitive to two important fractionation regimes, and they're differentially indicative of these regimes as well. Equilibrium fractionation, or Rayleigh distillation, which we're pretty familiar with after Shahong's uh, class, and particularly her homework. Latches are, yep. <laughs> um, and kinetic fractionation, or non-equilibrium fractionation. Um, now, Rayleigh distillation, equilibrium fractionation, the most important take-home message here is that Rayleigh distillation is a statement of the relationship between the initial composition of a single isotopic species and its final composition. So it's the difference between deuterium, uh, the initial composition or initial value of deuterium and its final value, or the initial composition or, or value of uh, oxygen and its final value. Now for this reason, um, the equilibrium fractionation is more diagnostic of the meteorological conditions at the site of deposition, meaning the meteorological distance away from its source, um, the uh, temperature and relative humidity uh, aloft at the altitude of condensation, other variables like that. Now instead, if we consider the kinetic effects of uh, non-equilibrium fractionation, this take-home message, the, the important relationship here is the initial relationship uh, between the initial isotopic values of deuterium and oxygen-18 at the source, at the moisture source. Now, these two isotopic species respond very sensitively and very differently to uh, uh, different um, regimes of, uh, kinetic regimes of things like diffusion at the sea surface. Um, so for that reason, uh, deuterium excess is diagnostic of the meteorological conditions and thermodynamic conditions at the source of precipitation. Now, since uh, deuterium excess is a, a value that we can measure and calculate and it's diagnostic of the meteorological conditions at the source of precipitation, we can use that to build a profile of uh, a much narrower suite of locations around the world that match the profile, um, such that we're able to actually constrain, um, relatively speaking, the moisture source. So in answer to your question, Don, um, 
what we or what my master's thesis is hoping to do is actually reconstruct using mass balance, uh, ideas of mass balance, uh, the relative proportions of uh, moisture that's contributing or arriving on the north slope of Alaska between that which, which is evaporated at the subtropical high and that which is actually evaporated out of the Arctic Ocean. Um, so I, I will be looking for a correlation between sea ice extent and uh, deuterium excess. Um, so the significance of uh, the predictive power of deuterium excess or of a novel uh, way to inquire into the Ar uh, Arctic hydrological cycle really is uh, fairly straightforward. This will help us with uh, all kinds of climate models with the idea of uh, mass balance, uh, transfer of latent heat, um, variety of other things that are fairly important when it comes to picking which of Lachazar's uh, uh, climate models is the right one to consider for the future. So like all scientific talks, uh, talks I need to say muchas gracias to a bunch of people. Great, I'd love to take any questions anybody has. based on a uh, storm by storm sampling um, of precipitation in Bill Faro and that piece of Alaska. Now fortunately, I have uh, two years worth of those storms. Um, unfortunately, Barrow hasn't given me most of my samples or maybe hasn't collected them, just hasn't told me, whereas Akasuk has uh, collected nearly twice as much. Um, so I'm not sure what the value of the relationships um, that I pick out in my master's will actually be on a, a long-term scale. Um, but I think it's a good starting place, particularly for these guys who are going to follow me do this for a few more years. And the general idea is that if there's a tight correlation, then most of the precipitation is locally sourced? or uh, Not that or it's what, locally what sourced, but that there is some component of Arctic moisture that we can uh, quantitatively identify. Do you know if anybody's like, taken snow samples uh, in a trans-Arctic basin sense? to do the sort of analysis that you're talking about to say, okay, here in the Bering Sea, it's mainly from you know, tropical. As we go further north, it's still tropical and maybe it's something different. You know, the only reason I'm gonna say no is because this is a novel application of stable isotope meteorology. So the, the ability to ask those questions has yet to be constrained. I'm hoping that my masters will kind of point the way for, for people who are better at this to, to really refine the process. Um, but that's a great idea. Right. Yeah, it seems like it would be a good thing to do. Sure, sure. I mean, certainly we what we do is uh, reconstruct storm tracks. Um, NOAA and the NSIDC are great for that. Um, Anthony is working on developing a, a model through high split um, that I'm using that's actually a really uh, a nuanced presentation of uh, where the source of the moisture, uh, where it's been for the past eight days. Um, but I'm not sure how useful that is in a transarctic place, considering it, it varies based upon what hour you pick. Um, for its deposition, let alone, you know, over the course of days. Fantastic. One more question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, for uh, Equisook, for example, sure. uh, what are uh, a couple of different possible outcomes that you might get, and why should I care? Why Which should you care? Which of those is more like the truth? Sure. Um, no, that's a great question. Um, what I really hope to see are, is either a very tight correlation between sea ice extent and deuterium excess or uh, no correlation between sea ice extent and deuterium excess. And uh, you should care because then I can definitively, as far as I'm concerned, say that deuterium excess is a reasonable um, variable um, to use to inquire into the Arctic hydrological cycle. So I'm almost developing a new set of theoretical practices that can then be used and applied. Um, to, to new questions in the energy balance of the Arctic. So it's just kind of tool development. I don't really care about the details of what you find, whether but whether the technique works or not. I tend to think of it as tool development. Um, certainly, it would be fascinating to know whether or not uh, water is uh, water from the Arctic Ocean actually significantly contributes to Arctic pre precipitation. <coughs> if only because maybe then that would start to explain the increase in particularly winter precipitation in the Arctic. That last part sounds sounds better. Yeah. You, know, you can you can do better than it just being tool developed. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> that sounds good. <clears throat> That's great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
well, as we, as we build to the exciting climax here, we're going to move into ecology. Um, <laughs> just happened to work out that way. Um, and uh, our next presentation is by uh, Marcus Welker. He's a graduate student in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology program. Um, title of his, his presentation is Ecosystem Effects of Expanding Flora and Fauna in the Arctic. Is this thing working to change slides? Yeah. To yeah. move back and forth? Yeah. Great. Uh, my name is Mark Smoker, and Anchorage, Alaska, and the Arctic are my home. Climate change is projected to cause vegetation shifts because rising temperatures favor taller, denser vegetation. And these climate-induced changes in Arctic landscapes are important to people and animals in terms of food, fuel, culture, and habitat. These are two of the key findings from the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment. Today's presentation on the expansion of tree lining in the north will provide a case study looking at the effects of climate change on the floor of the north, <laughs> what the ecosystem effects will be, and how this will affect the people that call the North Home. It is expected that these changes in the North will occur this century. And some of these changes in tree line are already occurring, like in places in Alaska, like on the west side of the Brooks Range. They're already seeing these changes and being able to measure these. And the presence of tree trunks on the north slope of the uh, Siberian Arctic are evidence the tree line has the potential to expand to a significant degree. And importantly, the boreal forest currently covers 17% of the land surface of Earth. So changes in the boreal forest and the ecosystem effects of this are really important for global cycles. It's expected that large areas of Eurasia, here in the north of Russia, and Alaska and Canada are all expected to become forested. These are large areas of, that are currently polar desert and tundra, and these are going to become forested. And it's estimated that tree line will move at approximately 125 kilometers per degree Celsius of warming. However, the exact location of where this occurs, when this occurs, and to what extent this occurs is going to be controlled by many variables. And I'm going to talk about two, soil and water. So currently, the soils of the Arctic look like this in a lot of places. And these are terrible places for seeds to germinate and new larger plants to grow. However, it's expected that changes in disturbances will make these soils potentially viable locations for forest and other larger vegetation to grow. Additionally, disturbances, such as changes in precipitation, and changes in the hydrological cycle due to permafrost is expected to change these soils, again, making it possible for trees and other larger vegetation to move into these landscapes. So now onto the media issue. What is the ecosystem <coughs> impact of expanding forest? Well, as tundra becomes forested, we're going to move from lighter, smoother surfaces to darker, more textured forest. And this is going to transform it from a highly reflective surface to a low reflective surface. And this is going to allow for the landscape to absorb more solar radiation, which is going to lead to global warming. And interestingly, black spruce, which is a major component of the boreal forest in North America, is the least reflective of any vegetation type. Additionally, there's a seasonal impact. As the boreal forest expands, it's going to cover up this highly reflective surface that occurs in the winter in the polar deserts and the tundra. Again, having an impact on the climate. There's also an important feedback loop that's going to occur. So currently, this is what we're doing, producing carbon dioxide, which is leading to step two here, which is the growth of the forest and the expansion of the forest, 
which is then going to absorb more heat because it's darker than the tundra, and that's going to allow for more forest to grow. So the soils and the water and this feedback loop are all going to have important uh, controls on where and when the forest expands in the 21st century. One thing, one current question that scientists are interested in is understanding whether or not as the forest expands it'll absorb more carbon because they're more biologically productive landscapes. So if you think about what tundra looks like and what you think about what the forest looks like, you know that there's a lot more carbon in the forest stored in the biology and the organisms. So they're expecting, well, they're studying this, and they think that this, the additional carbon storage in the forest is actually going to be outweighed by the increase in solar absorption of the forest. And so there won't actually be a mediating of this uh, increased absorption of energy and so again the forest expanding forest is going to lead to regional and potential global warming as the forest expands the tundra of the area is going to shrink and it's expected and projected that in the 21st century the tundra is going to shrink to its lowest extent in the last 21,000 years which is going to have serious impacts on all of these organisms which are adapted to life on the tundra and the polar desert. Uh, mosses and lichens, which are important forage for these guys, caribou, which are again very important for the people of the north, have an important, are an important, have an important storehouse in the north. They have uh, the greatest bi biodiversity in the north, and these are really expected to be uh, heavily hit by changing climate and expanding forest, which again, could have serious impact on these guys. Changes in the Arctic and the ecosystem effects of the boreal forest are likely to be complex, and simple linear changes are unlikely. There are going to be thresholds that once the forest expands across these ecosystems, it'll be not very difficult to go back to. And there are many variables that are playing into this. And I'm going to talk about two interesting ones, fire and insect outbreaks, which are expected to change the ecosystem impacts of the expanding fire, of the expanding forest. So in these areas in North America and in Russia, where the major expansions of forest will occur, we're seeing an increase in the growing season. In some places, by as much as 40, 50, 60 days in the growing season. And this is going to have an impact on the fire season. And over the last 30 years in North America, we've seen a doubling in the extent of area burned. And it's projected to increase by another 80% in the next 100 years. And in Russia, there's been an annual 4 million hectares burned over the last 30 years, and this is projected to continue increasing in extent over the next century. There's an additional really important uh, ecological occurrence that is happening as these fires expand in area. The soils of the north are large storehouses for carbon because as this plant material has grown over the last thousands of years, it then dies, and because the soils are so cold, there isn't a lot of decomposition that takes place, which releases these nutrients, which can be used by other organisms. So there's large mats of organic material that, as the fires move over these areas, these soils, which have all these carbon stores in them, there is the potential for huge amounts of carbon to be liberated from the soils, which will further climate change. And it's projected that about 1 billion tons of this organic matter are going to be burned due to these increasing fire extent in the Arctic. An additional complexity of the north are these little spruce bark beetles, which are turning <coughs> the forest into huge dead stands, which, lo and behold, leads to more fire, which again has the potential to disrupt social ecological systems of the north physically, 
by you know causing the wildlife to have to move. If your home's in the forest, it's all of a sudden on fire, but also through these carbon liberations that are in the soil. Now, if this is your house, or this is your grocery store, there are serious negative consequences of expanding forest. If the decrease in the reflectivity of the forest outweighs the additional carbon storage of the forest, then climate change could be exacerbated. Additionally, if the expansion of tree line causes for large amounts of greenhouse gases to be liberated from the soils due to the fire and insect outbreak interactions, then again, climate change could be exacerbated, affecting people <coughs> worldwide. So even though we're talking about boreal forests expanding in the north, these guys down here in Miami could be seriously affected by rising sea levels due to thermal expansion because of increased carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. The final two slides. It's important to consider that there are positive benefits of expanding boreal forests. There are many important species that reside in the forest that have economic, ecologically, and inherent value to the people of the north. And Many of these species, especially these fur-bearing ones, are seriously threatened in their current ranges. <clears throat> Finally, we have choices to make in the 21st century about what type of development we're going to do. We can choose option one, traditional resource development, such as mining or oil exploration. Or we can choose the more renewable, less environmentally destructive option, logging. Expanding logging operations is a social benefit of expanding forest and shouldn't be forgotten considering the social ecological consequences of changing forest. Thank you very much. Some questions? Yeah. At the end, you mentioned the possibilities for habitat uh, for endangered species. Um, do you, will the rate of uh, forest expansion kind of keep up with climate change and, and actually provide that sufficient habitat for these animals? I mean, is that, is that a legitimate connection to make uh, as far as providing the, the function and habitat for these species? I don't know. Yeah, um, that's a good question, and certainly for like the wolverines, um, which are threatened currently, that has a lot to do with uh, snow cover, uh, is what they're finding, and so depending on um, perhaps as the forest expands into areas which are receiving more snow, uh, they may, may be able to uh, use those habitats more efficiently than habitats in the south. Um, changes in precipitation could of course affect uh, whether it is increasing snow cover, decreasing snow cover. Yeah, uh, in the beginning you mentioned the relationship between temperature increase and north advance of the forest, like one degree for every 125 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Was that just based on uh, past reconstructions, or does that include like all the feedbacks you mentioned? Uh, that is the current best estimate for what will occur in the 21st century. Um, I kind of, I, it, they, they said 100 to 150. I just kind of picked a number in the middle for an easier number. Um, as you can, on the map showing it, there's obviously going to be places where there is larger growth than 100, 150, 125, depending on the conditions. Um, and some places it'll be much less. Yeah, Matt? These are really slow moving systems that you're that you're talking about. The, a transition from tundra to spruce forest, boreal forest is is gonna take centuries, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, the transient dynamics seem like given how long that takes are gonna are gonna be crucial. What do we know as as you start to warm up tundra and it becomes more forest like you probably are going to lose soil carbon, and there's a lot of it to lose. 
if you start growing more biomass above the ground, that's uh, uh, moving it in the direction of a carbon sink. What's the state of knowledge about how those balance? Is there, is there going to be more carbon lost or more carbon taken in over you know, the 200 years of, or so of transient dynamics? The current thought is that the, car the additional carbon storage will not outweigh the loss that is occurring due to the, s the soil carbon being released. And so there is serious there is the potential for large amounts of carbon to be released from these ecosystems. Thank you very much. Well, our final presentation is by uh, Nina Lanny. Nina's from the EEB graduate program, and I think we'll hear a bit more about the forest and some of these changes. The title of her presentation is Temperature Dependence of Species Interactions in the Boreal Forest in Arctic Shrub Tundra. Real quick. Forward, backwards, light up. Or pointer. <coughs> yeah. And I'm not going to turn on the timer. Ready to go. Great. Thanks. Um, I'm Nina Laney, and I'm a graduate student in ecology. I'm working in Matt Ayer's lab. Um, and I'm going to give a broad overview of uh, some topics dealing with envi environmental change in the Arctic tundra and boreal forest. Um, narrowing in to talk about an area I'm working with more, um, which is the temperature dependence of species interactions. <coughs> um, so the uh, fourth IPCC report um, predicts uh, changes in ecosystem boundaries under climate change according to a, a climate envelope model. This is what Marcus was referring to. Um, where they uh, proje project the climate out to some point in the future and then um, match species with the area that they're best suited to. Um, so under this pr uh, prediction, the, the pale purple is tundra. Um, so the graminoid tundra would be the low um, grasses, sedges, lichens, things like that. Um, and the shrub tundra or shrub, shrubland um, would also include some larger uh, willows and alders. Um, and then the dark green is the boreal forest, so that's um, spruces, pine, fir, and some deciduous trees like larch or aspen. Um, and you can see that uh, the, the tree line is projected to move um, quite a bit northward um, with implications for um, albedo and carbon cycling um, that Marcus was talking about. Um, however, sorry. Um, and um, we've observed uh, some changes that are consistent with these predictions. Um, this is a time series of pictures from Alaska, and the, the dark spots are shrubs. We can see an increase in shrub growth. Um, and uh, there's a, a feedback going on here where the shrubs, uh, uh, they keep more snow, um, which insulates the snow, um, which insulates the soil and raises the soil temperature. Um, it also increases the moisture there, which causes more shrub growth and is an example of how this transition process can, can go on at the positive feedback. Um, but species interactions are, are also important in this scenario. Um, so uh, in a, a really elegant exper experiment in Greenland, um, Eric Post and his colleagues fenced off um, areas of the graminoid tundra from large herbivores um, such as the musk oxen and the caribou. Um, and in the pie chart, the blue and the rose color are, the, are shrubby growth, and all the rest is the, the graminoid tundra. Um, and um, you can see that when they kept out the large herbivores, uh, the shrubs grew more. Um, when they warmed those plots, uh, the shrubs grew even more. Um, and when the large herbivores were allowed to graze in those warmed plots, they, they cut back on, on the shrub growth. Um, so, so it seems that these species interactions are also determining uh, the community that grows there. Um, and in 2005, they had an outbreak of uh, caterpillars, um, which also decreased the shrub growth. So we have um, different uh, 
different herbivores, different types of species interaction is determining the community. Um, the indicators of climate change in the boreal forest um, are likely to be an increase in fire regimes and also an increase in, in insect infestation as well as altered tree lines. Um, the fire regimes and the insect infestations are a, a natural and essential uh, part of the boreal forest that uh, maintain diversity and um, different age stands. Um, um, so it, it's likely that um, increases uh, in these fire or insect disturbances are going to be the, the, the mechanisms by which change happens. So looking for, so looking for changes in ex extreme events um, is perhaps where to look uh, more than, than slow progressions up in, in the tree line. Um, and this chart right here, um, oops, sorry. Um, this, the, the take home message in this chart right here which shows the interactions between the, the boreal forest and the biosphere is that every arrow is double headed. So insect disturbance affects fire disturbance and fire disturbance affects insect disturbance. Um, both of them are affected by climate and weather and in turn both of them can affect climate and weather. Um, so there's certainly a lot of feedbacks going on in the system. Um, in the boreal forest, uh, insect, insect outbreaks are moving northward. Um, so uh, the, the, for the uh, mountain pine beetle outbreaks in British Columbia are about 10 times bigger um, than any ever recorded. Um, and mountain pine beetle um, needs uh, mature pines as host trees and then a couple years in a row of warm summers and pretty mild winters. Um, so. Uh, at the start of the outbreaks in BC, there was about three times the amount of mature pine as has historically been present in that area, um, in part because of fire, uh, fire suppression and, and other um, uh, human changes to the landscape. Um, also, the effect of temperature on the physiology of this little guy um, just allows it to, to develop more in outbreak. Um, similarly, outbreaks, the most severe outbreaks of the winter moth up in northern Europe, um, indicated by the red there, are um, also in the, in the northern part, right on the edge of where the, the boreal forest meets the tundra. Um, and again, the effects of temperature on, on the physiology of, of these caterpillars um, contributes to their ability to outbreak in these northern parts. Um, the spruce budworm uh, is a, a naturally occurring outbreaking species in the boreal forests of Canada. Um, and they have a, a 35 to 40 year outbreak cycle. Um, and one, uh, one question is, is with increased temperature, um, are, insect, are, are out, spruce, spruce budworms outbreaks also going to become um, more fre frequent, perhaps more severe or longer in duration? Um, and uh, this food web here, um, which I noticed just because it's incredibly complex, <laughs> really a huge diversity of species, um, has spruce bugworm right here in the, the darker rectangle, and it's a uh, host plant, um, balsam fir, its food source. Um, and then all the squares are uh, parasitoids, they're ichneumonid wasps, some of which are pictured here, um, that are, uh, lay their eggs inside the caterpillars. They're, they're sort of like predators in that they cause caterpillar mortality. Um, and all the circles at the bottom are viruses and other pathogens that infect um, the spruce budworm. Um, so one really natural question is, um, if temperature can affect these caterpillars and increase their growth, um, can it also affect all of their invertebrate predators and these viruses so that um, through the effects of predation, there's actually less spruce budworm in the forest? Um, so one way of looking at this system, um, if the, the circle represents the pool of caterpillar biomass, um, one possibility is that caterpillar biomass increases with increased temperature um, through effects on larval growth and development. Um, another possibility is that this biomass actually decreases um, due to increased predation if temperature affects the predators more than it does um, the caterpillars. Um, and a third um, possibility is that caterpillar biomass actually remains the same um, because both growth and predation sort of increase in concert, resulting in no net change. Um, so in my work here, I'm going to 
uh, spend some time um, distinguishing among these three hypotheses. And um, I chose the spruce budworm system to, to introduce these ideas, but um, it also applies to just uh, nat natural herbivores um, in the boreal forest, on the tundra, temperate hardwood forest. Um, and there's greater applicability. Um, an additional way um, to uh, represent the second hypothesis, that an increase in invertebrate predation overrides an increase in growth rates. Um, could be like here. Um, as temperature increases, uh, plant development increases up to a certain point, um, and then photorespiration photo overrides uh, photosynthesis, um, sort of negating, negating some of the um, development. There's, there's an upper limit to how much temperature can really help plants. Um, insect herbivores, such as caterpillars, um, their development sh definitely increases with temperature up to a certain point, um, but their invertebrate predators such as the um, parasitoid wasps or spiders, um, they have to fly or walk in order to catch their prey, and muscle movement is highly temperature dependent. Um, and so, so if their vital rates are increased more than their insect herbivores, this provides um, one, one method, um, or to provide support for hypothesis number two. Um, so, in summary, um, both climate and species interactions are important to determining ecosystem boundaries, and those species interactions can be temperature dependent. Um, and in the, in the boreal forest, um, the, the mechanisms of change we're looking at um, may be um, in the frequency of extreme events, including insect outbreaks and fires. And thanks. Um, I can take any questions. Are there any other examples where, uh, like hypothesis two, has been observed in other systems where increasing temperatures has caused for increasing predation, predation of like some pest? Like, um, so it has been observed in other systems um, with different locations. So, like uh, grasslands in California, uh, the let me get straight. Who is the predator? Um, they're water limited, so they dumped water on instead of warming plots. And when they, w in plots where they dumped more water on, the predators of the grasshoppers actually reduced the grasshopper community. And I think they even observed, they may or may not have observed a corresponding increase in uh, plant production. Um, and then there was one other <coughs> case similar, it was double water instead of temperature, I think in Patagonia. Those are the only two I've been able to find. Um, could you speculate a little bit about the possibility of increased susceptibility? So you mentioned, like, well, are the predators going to increase and are the viruses going to increase, increase? But is there any literature or any thoughts about from the herbivores and their susceptibility to? Um, yeah, <laughs> there's um, there's some literature out there. So, like, at warmer um, when the parasitoid lays the egg in the caterpillar, they're they're able to encapsulate it or. Uh, pitch it out, so to speak, um, so that it can't develop, and they they may be able to, they can, w their caterpillars are more effective at encapsulating a higher temperature. What I'm not entirely sure about is, um, so how does that actually translate into the, so, so does it actually slow down the parasitoid, and, and how much? Um, viruses and temperature are, are another cool one, and I think um, it's been studied with uh, uh, malaria. Um, transmission of malaria, and, and they are they are sensitive to temperature. Always, I don't know if there's enough out there to, to say that there's a distinct pattern. Yeah, I have one question. Yes. <coughs> How might invasive species play into this? Are there other outbreak pests that may move into the Arctic now, or maybe there's some biocontrol possibilities? Um, what what are people speculating about in terms of new players in this story? Um, well, yeah, so, so invasive species are, are a big worry that I chose to, to leave out, you know, in terms of a, a, a focus. Um, I think invasive species tend to be so successful because they find an enemy-free space. And so if, um, if it's a case of an organism who's able to expand its range into, you know, into a spot that's so now it's the, the new edge of its thermal tolerance um, under 
under this model right here, an invertebrate predator, which most biocontrol agents are, um, would would be at a disadvantage, you know what I mean, in that, that cool area. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, if, it can, if it can find an enemy free space. Thanks, Steve. Well, this is fantastic. Uh, we, we got it all done within the time allotted, which is excellent. Um, everyone stayed on time. Uh, just fantastic, and I appreciate all the effort that you put into your presentations. Um, at 5.30 in the same room, um, for those IGERT students, faculty that want to hook up, we're in uh, doing a teleconference with uh, Kansas and the two Alaska IGERTs about the workshop coming up in March. So anyone who wants to stay for that is certainly welcome. I think we had some refreshments or food um, following this. So I want to thank and applaud all of you for all your work here and a great time the faculty had in uh, working in this class with you this term. So congratulations. Thank you.